good afternoon good evening friends depending upon which part of the world you are joining us from uh, this is dr vijay agarwal i am the president of uh, consortium of accredited healthcare organizations kaho and it is my proud privilege today again to welcome you to our 7th isqua kaho international webinar series program uh, kaho is committed to providing and working for safer patient care we have been working for the increasing the capacity building of all our stakeholders be it the healthcare organizations or the diagnostic centers or the individual quality professionals and this program which is being led by the individual quality professionals being led by dr anuradha pichumani is a has been a great great success and i welcome you all and uh, the program today is on disaster management and resilience in hospitals which is being addressed by one of the most i would say person who had joined kaho program long time back and it's a great privilege for us to have professor jeffrey breath white once again but to chair this session and to moderate this program i have the pleasure of introducing you uh, dr sujit chatterji dr sujit chatterji is the ceo of lh hiranandani hospital since inception the hospital is a 244 bedded super specialty hospital located in hiranandani gardens powai hospital has been the winner of the ramakrishna bajaj national quality award in 2008 and 2016 he was also the winner of the international asia pacific quality award in 2008 and 16 the only hospital from india to win this prestigious award led the hiranandani group to arguably be the first public private partnership in healthcare with navi mumbai municipal corporation he is well known for sharing his views on healthcare in national and international forums he is a very well known figure in number of kaho programs and platforms dr sujit chatterjee's area of specialization is obstetrics and gynecology he was a doctor in the armed forces earlier was selected by the armed forces for the super specialization in the gynecology and oncology now he has so many awards to his credit and so many projects that he has initiated that i will not like to uh, dwell on that lest i encroach upon the time that he has to take and professor jaffrey has to take so over you to you dr sujit chatterjee for introducing professor jaffrey brathwaite sir thank you very much dr agarwal and today's topic is disaster management and resilience in healthcare and before i introduce dr jeffrey let me start with a cliche and the cliche is the world is at war now everybody knows this but history will record this war as a war that was fought by doctors and not soldiers a war that was fought with soap and not guns a war that was fought by keeping distance and not contact a war that was fought by staying at home and not coming into the battlefield now in a war there are winners only there are no runners up and we as mankind are going to be the winners and we are not going to be the runners up so therefore without much ado i would like to introduce professor jeffrey braithwaite he is the founding director of the australian institute of health innovation director of Sense, center for healthcare resilience and implementation science and professor of health systems research faculty of medicine and health science at the macquarie university sydney australia he has appointments at six other universities internationally and he is a board member and the president 
of the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, which is ISQA, and the consultant to the World Health Organization. That just proves that Professor Jeffrey is the leader of quality in healthcare, as ISQA is the gold standard. His research examines the changing nature of health systems, attracting funding of more, more than 145 million Australian dollars. His key expertise is in quality of care in patient safety, systems improvement, and implementation science. He has led the international colleagues book series on profound, deep, deepened understanding of resilient healthcare and international health reform with over 14 books to his credit. Research he has designed and more than 100 studies he has led have reconceptualized healthcare applying complexity science and cultural theories to a wide range of healthcare problems. Professor Braithwaite has contributed to over 640 referred publications and has presented at international and national conferences on more than a thousand occasions and including 110 keynote addresses. His research appears in journals such as the BMJ, the JAMA, the Lancet, Social Science and Medicine, BMJ Quality and Safety, and International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. He has received over 50 different national and international awards for his teaching and research with so many publications, with so many awards. I'm sure Professor Jeffrey will have a scintillating session today. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever, for, from whichever part of the world you are for an exciting session with Professor Jeffrey. Over to you, sir. Dr. Sujit, you are too kind. How will I ever live up to such a fantastic introduction? I sometimes wonder at the people like you who can do such fabulous introductions and sometimes the talk isn't as good as the introduction. So I shall have to work hard to justify the invitation. May I thank you, the Consortium for Accredited Healthcare Organizations. May I thank you, Dr. Sujit Chatterjee for, uh, for hosting this session and chairing it. Could I thank the core committee, the founding members, patrons, coordinators, representatives, and secretariat of CAHO. And it's a pleasure to be working with you once again. Also a warm welcome and a pleasure to be working with some of my Indian colleagues and my international colleagues once again. I'm going to share my screens. So the topic that I was um, asked to talk on is disaster management and resilience in healthcare. And of course, with such a topic, you can't help thinking about, as Dr. Sujya Chatterjee did, the pandemic that is currently raging across the world and is affecting India, of course, to a considerable degree. Um, so I'm going to touch on that, but I'm going to, not going to dominate my discussion with COVID-19 because Many other speakers have done this, and you are experts in your own country on the pandemic and how it is affecting your health system and your population. But I will touch on it a little bit, and especially towards the end. So as Dr. Sujit Chatterjee um, said, I am from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, and I do health systems research, research that strengthens healthcare and underpins high quality and safety. Our logo is heal, learn, discover. And I think those three words are very important, not just for health systems, but for, for researchers like myself, who are very keen on research, not just because it might have a publication in the British Medical Journal, but so that research is relevant to especially people who are running hospitals or policymakers or people who are on the front lines of care, or people who are interested in translating research into better practice. My research institute canvasses a lot of different topics, as Dr. Sujit indicated, and here are some of them. These are grants that we have, or research centers that we have within our large institute of a couple of hundred people, 
all working on health systems improvement. I'm also president of ISQA and just a qu quick few short um, uh, reminders about ISQA, although an audience like this knows a lot about ISQA, obviously, and, and in this audience are many people who are FISQAs, fellows of ISQA, and other important um, uh, uh, roles that people play in ISQA. But ISQA has a mission that's very similar to the Consortium for Accredited Healthcare Organizations, CAHO. It's to improve quality, not just nationally, but internationally and to provide safer care worldwide. ISQA strives to be a leader globally. We have many programs, but one that I would point out to you is our fellowship program, uh, the flagship education program of ISQA, which encourages people to go embark on a journey of education to become a fellow of ISQA with the initials FISQA afterwards. And as I say, many members of CAHO or people associated with CAHO are FISQA. Uh, we also do other education programs, and a lot of this information is on the ISQA website. I recommend you go there because there's a lot of downloadable, very interesting information all in one place. Um, why get involved? We have a very thriving scientific program, uh, especially our annual conference, which is when, when we're not locked out of travel, <laughs> is a very popular thing to do and many people on the call I know when many people on this webinar strive to get to Esquire each year or in fact do go to Esquire each year there's lots going on and the most important thing I think is the networking the catching up with old friends and sharing ideas internationally about what you're doing from a quality and safety point of view. Um, Esquire is also responsible internationally for a thriving accreditation program it's got an external evaluation association associated with it, and um, it, it helps and supports accreditation across the world, including for organizations, standards, and surveyor training programs. That's how to contact us. But now, let me get on with the talk. I would hate to disappoint the chair after such a warm introduction and spend too much time and overstay my welcome. I would not like to do that, Dr. Sujit. So let's talk about resilience first. I have prepared more slides than I need, and I'm going to gloss over some of them just because I've got them there for you to delve into later, because I'm making a complete talk, but I'm going to highlight some of the things that I think are important concerning disaster management and resilience. So the normal meanings of resilience are to prevent bad things from happening. We're thinking about health systems here, or the ability to prevent something bad from becoming worse, or the ability to recover, the ability to bounce back. That's what's normally meant by resilience. Eric Holnagel, the leading theorist who I work with closely, is in Denmark. He's uh, presented many times, as I have, on topics such as this. And he says a system is resilient if it can adjust uh, before, during, and after events or disturbances and thereby keep on keeping on despite the pressures that come on. And of course, this is very relevant in the COVID era uh, about being able to continue to run services despite the pressures on those services that the additional patients, additional high mortality rates, the additional uh, burden of disease that has come on health systems in the modern era. But this could be any pandemic or any crisis that we're thinking of with this definition. So it's, it's the quickness of response, the adaptiveness, rather than having to tough it out, it's the ability to be adaptive, the ability to monitor what's going on and learn from that. Resilience is something that's built in, baked into the DNA of the organization. And if it's resilient, it has this capacity to keep on going despite what we might throw at the hospital or the health service or the system. There's a lot of workarounds taking place um, and learning taking place. In short, there's improvisation, flexibility, and a capacity to maneuver in a resilient system. So the question you're now asking, I hope, is, well, how resilient is my system? How resilient with this definition is my hospital, my province, my services, 
my chain of hospitals or my entire health system in my country. So I just want to mention something up front that leads straight on from resilience, and that is the notion of how complex are the systems that we have to manage. Health, no one's invented a health system, and no one's invented a system that is more complex than healthcare. So it's not um, rational. We don't have the capacity to just say of a health system because of that complexity, if I do X, Y will occur. In other words, to have a linear view of change, that won't work. Healthcare isn't like if I issue a policy that will fix everything. Or if I issue a guideline or a new paper and I show it, a new paper from New England Journal of Medicine, a new randomized trial, that's incontrovertible proof that we should practice this way, that that will just be rolled out in a health system. If it was that easy, we would have higher quality care and less safety problems. So healthcare is a complex adaptive system, not a linear system. And so we published recently, last couple of years, a white paper on this, which I draw to your attention. It's a free download. You don't have to buy it like some of those very, very big books that I help edit or, or, or write. Um, this one is free and it makes the case that change and improvement in healthcare can never be simple and it's rarely linear where you, if you do Y, X will occur. And that explains it. And I'm borrowing on that. Now I'd like to turn to some case examples of resilient healthcare and disaster management. One case is the Japanese case of Fukushima and the triple disaster that occurred. You know this story, but it's worthwhile raising in the context of resilience and disaster management. It was 10 years ago that there was a great earthquake which caused a tsunami to occur, which washed over Fukushima and uh, took out the nuclear um, plant um, as a consequence. This was a huge event um, and a very serious one because not really since Chernobyl had there been um, a major meltdown in a nuclear generator. Uh, there were three, a triple, um, a triple consequence to this, a triple event occurred. There was to people, deaths, people missing, people evacuated from their homes, economic, huge economic uh, consequences to this, um, uh, industrially and from an e economy point of view, and major environmental problems that still exist today, contaminated soil, high levels of radiation. Five years later, many of those problems have been exacerbated despite the efforts of the authorities, the Japanese government and the people of that province. So um, lots of people displaced, major economic uh, downscale, downstream effects and ongoing environmental uh, problems because of contamination, uh, radioactive contamination. Currently, Hardly any of people have returned home. Uh, nine of 54 nuclear reactors, which were the main source of uh, power for Japan, uh, have been restarted. And the major environmental uh, consequences have continued to this day and will continue for many years to come. So the question for Japan is how does it get the Fukushima area uh, uh, back and, and, the, and the nuclear reactors um, and the power um, uh, on, on an ongoing basis back to the new normal, whatever the new normal is for Japan. At first, people said we can never have any more nuclear reactors in Japan. But later, it's proven not possible for Japan to do that because it's too early for an entire country like Japan to go wholly renewable. And so it has to go back to coal and oil, which is not good for the environment, but you have to have power and electricity just like India has um, a major striving to make sure everyone's got reliable power and, um, and uh, can't move to renewables immediately, so too with a, a high-income country such as Japan. 
my, just hold those examples that I'm going to give in mind because we'll return to the, the, the payoff and what this means um, towards the end of the talk. My next example is Spanish flu. And people have become accustomed to this example because the current pandemic makes us recall how did we deal with pandemics in the past? So briefly, people know about this example. A hundred years ago, uh, the Spanish flu hit. It was earlier in medical history, so there was less capacity to deal with it than there is today. It's infected 500 million people, about a third of the world, 50 million deaths. There was a lack of knowledge about disease. This was thought to be a bacterial disease. Viruses were a new concept. There was no testing of any reliability. There were no vaccines, no antibiotics or antivirals. Lack of access to doctors. And many doctors were private or independent. They weren't, um, they weren't in a system of care as much as they are today. Um, it's true that after the Spanish flu, some countries turned away from science. Uh, America, for example, embraced alternative medicine. Other countries embraced scientific methods and all countries eventually embraced scientific methods. And there were improvements as a consequence over the last hundred years of, in disease surveillance, the collection and storage of data on which to make decisions and public health. But there's a major question that the Spanish flu asks of us today. And that is, will we re-embrace public health, which is the cornerstone of battling pandemics, whatever form they take, after COVID-19? Because that's what happened after the Spanish flu. But over time, a hundred years later, many, many countries forgot the importance of public health as a cornerstone leading up to the current pandemic. It also led to a lot of socialized healthcare. That is to say, health systems that were extensively healthcare for all, whether they're privately funded or publicly funded, um, but it was the idea that society should have care and everyone should have access to healthcare. And of course, the World Health Organization is currently one of its mantras, one of its, um, one of its um, pleas to all countries is to have universal health coverage for its whole population. And that, again, is a cornerstone protection against a pandemic. My next example, briefly, is an example in Australia, which we call the thunderstorm asthma event. And it, too, is instructive. And I'm going to introduce during this example a tool for disaster management that you may find useful. Some of you will know this tool. Some of you will find it useful to think about your organization or your system in terms of disaster management and resilience. So this is the resilience assessment grid, sometimes called the resilience analysis grid. And it says any system undergoing or facing a disaster should have four capacities, four potentials four abilities, if you like. The ability to learn prior to and during the crisis or the pandemic or the event, the ability to respond relatively rapidly, the ability to anticipate what's going to happen next or what's the next problem we're going to face, the next crisis, and the ability to monitor along the way. Now, let me put this into a case example for you. So in 2016, in November, in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia, uh, incidentally, where many Indians are, are, are uh, there's, a, there's quite a, a thriving Indian uh, um, uh, cohort uh, in the population uh, uh, who have had added great cultural value to uh, Melbourne. Uh, so uh, in November, November 26th, nearly 10,000 people presented at hospital simultaneously over a couple of days with breathing difficulties. What had happened was it was wet. It was September, uh, the month before, uh, very wet. There was a lot of pollen produced. Um, this pollen um, uh, was, uh, could get, it was too large to enter people's airways, but it was an unusually hot day. Indian and uh, Southeast Asian colleagues will know all about a hot day. Um, and by four, four o'clock in the afternoon, it was still hot and a strong wind was blowing and pollen grains were sucked up into a warm updraft and then ruptured. The pollen grains then returned to earth and created 
an asthma event that was relatively unprecedented. It was certainly not foreseen. So these are daily admissions in Australia to intensive care during this period. You can see the spike on November 26. Here's the total number of ambulance call outs by hour. Again, you can see the huge spike. This is the time of day. Here's the hourly presentations to hospitals in two of the cities in Melbourne, in, in Victoria, in that part of Australia, Melbourne and Geelong a Hospital. Um, you can see the spike in the emergency department presentations. And here's the age and sex distribution. This affected firstly young boys mostly with a lot of admissions from young males, um, kids really. And then uh, a lot of admissions also from uh, men and women uh, in, in the mid years. So those are the people that asthma was affecting and they were therefore hurriedly going to the emergency departments. This is the hourly respiratory presentations to Victoria Public Hospital emergency departments. So let's have a look at this with reference to the resilience uh, grid, to this way of analyzing a disaster that's unfolding. Firstly, there was no anticipation at first. This was completely unexpected. But then very quickly, there was communication across the system, across the health system. And um, uh, we realized at the time that the state communication system, the government communication systems weren't suited to rapid onset problems like this. Then there was the ability to monitor. There were obviously leading indicators and some early presentations that turned into a rush. And so the capacity to monitor the surge in demand was very important. Thirdly, the capacity to respond, to not stay um, with just the same staffing levels in the emergency department, for example, uh, and not to learn and communicate about what was happening. And fourthly, the capacity to learn during the event, but also to learn fast forward into future events so that the next crisis, the next pandemic, the next worry, the next thunder asthma event, we could learn from. Another instructive case um, is the bushfires in Australia. You know Australia, um, if you are an Indian, because we have a very similar climate to yours and you like us are prone to bushfires, hot, dry countries. Um, so a year and a bit ago, year and a half ago, were the worst bushfires in Australian history. It was very dry during winter. And then uh, with climate change, it was getting hotter. You know this story in Southeast Asia, whichever country you're from, you know this story. Um, it burnt 19.4 million hectares um, from July 2019 over about a five month, six month period. This was larger than the, the Amazon and California fires, which were being reported in the media at that stage uh, uh, each day. This was larger than those. If you want to get a sense of this, if you're from India, firefighters were fighting on a fire front of about 6,000 kilometers. Now, India from north to south is 3,214 kilometers, and from east to west is 2,933 kilometers. So this was absolutely unprecedented and massive. There weren't so many deaths, and certainly not when you think about it um, in terms of COVID-19, uh, but homes were destroyed, um, the economy was uh, affected, and it's estimated that a billion animals died Lots of species are now at great risk. And the tourism industry lost a lot of money too, although it lost a lot more once COVID hit because this was pre-pandemic. The pandemic hitting afterwards was a double um, hit to Australia. It also is attributable quite a lot to climate change. We are uh, on the front lines of climate change. Australia is the driest continent, uh, has less water than anyone else and it is uh, really suffering from climate change. There's declines in rainfall, declines in average rainfall, and drought, which is uh, meaning low soil moisture. Um, and climate change is also lengthening the fire season each year. 
This is our danger index. And I'm sure you in your country have a danger index. And the sad fact about this is the red is getting larger and the blue more temperate areas are getting smaller. And I think that's happening across the region, across Southeast Asia, across Africa, and also across India. So a couple of more points, and then I'll try and finish Dr. Sujit on time as you have given me instructions to do so, sir. And I always carry out the instructions of the chair wherever I possibly can. So um, it would be not appropriate for me not to mention COVID-19, but I don't want to labor it. And I didn't want the whole talk to be about that because you can go and get many sessions on COVID-19 and you are receiving much education on it across the world. So um, let me do a quick case study just for the benefit of the hospital, uh, the, the countries in the region, but without mentioning only one country in the region. So um, I've been doing work with Esquire on four countries. I've in fact been doing country, uh, work with Esquire on many countries to do with COVID-19. And I've uh, published a few studies on it at the systems level, looking at how do you have a stronger health system? Um, but let's have a look quickly at four countries, Australia, population 25 million, a wealthy um, high income country, um, Thailand, a middle income country with a population of 70 million, a developing economy and a universal health system. Sweden, which is a very interesting case, a population of 10 million, uh, universal health coverage, a uh, high income country, but took a different approach to COVID-19. And New Zealand, which I guess is the star of the show because it decided early to go for complete suppression not just mitigation, complete suppression, then elimination of COVID-19, a very brave step. Although it's, it's quite a small country and perhaps it's manageable in a smaller country, it's much harder to do, say in India or China or some of the other countries in the region. So a slide on each, but this is just for, I'm not gonna labor all of these slides, Dr. Sujit, I'm not gonna talk on each of these slides. I'm just doing this for people to drill into this if they wish to afterwards. Australia took a national approach had a national cabinet, funded telehealth, redirected services, put elective surgeries on hold, had a clear communication to the population strategy and introduced mandatory mask wearing and quarantine for returning travelers. And generally has been a success, although it's, it's, it's a high income country and has allocated quite a lot of resources to contract, contact tracing, testing and, um, increasing the capacity of the health workforce. Thailand's a very interesting case. Uh, it's, a, it's a low to middle income country. It uh, trained, for example, an army of health force volunteers, mainly female, to go to rural areas to educate people on hand hygiene and physical distancing. Um, had lots of volunteers to help. They already had a cultural pra practice of mask wearing for colds and flus, so that helped because the population took that on board early and it had learned from uh, when SARS and other infections had taken place and brought that learning into this pandemic. Sweden at first decided not to go the way the rest of the world was going and the World Health Organization suggested, which is lockdowns and mandatory wearing of masks and physical distancing. It essentially said the population knows what to do and should do that sensibly itself. And we think the population should rely on its own uh, common sense. Um, some, some institutions were closed down, but mostly the economy was not closed down. And at first, I think Sweden was thought of as a success, but later, I think Sweden has not done as well as some other countries, especially in that part of Northern Europe. So it's an interesting case study. And I think some people are suggesting it didn't turn out as well as the Swedes hoped. And then finally, New Zealand, where they didn't just do mitigation, they said, let's suppress and then eliminate. Pretty soon afterwards, um, they didn't have any deaths and only a couple of hundred active cases at that time, but nevertheless said, we're gonna go all the way here. We're gonna go hard and we're gonna change the way society thinks about distancing and mask wearing and quarantine. And they've been relatively successful compared to other countries in, in the world.
So there's four case studies, just briefly, and then I'll start the beginning of the end, Dr. Sujit, and finish on time, I hope. Um, just a snapshot. Here's the deaths and the confirmed cases for each of those countries, Australia, Thailand, Sweden, and New Zealand. And just to put that in context, here's the world data. This is as at overnight. I, I got this data overnight for you so that the slides are completely up to date. And um, uh, in India, I think at last count, there was 28 million cases. I know, I know some people have been worried that there's some underreporting and um, 331,909 deaths. Um, but I notice also the curve for India. I'll have to use my hands, Dr. Sujit. The curve is now going down for India and I, on, I and the rest of the world are so very pleased that maybe India is starting to see um, out of this entire uh, a very, very unfortunate set of events, tragic, uh, tragic set of events. And my friend, Dr. Jagger Swathi from, uh, from Malaysia too, you're, I think you're, you're going through a tough time at the moment too, and other countries in the region are. And uh, my, um, my solidarity and support to you uh, reaches out to you. Um, just for completeness, we've also done a couple of studies of COVID-19. Um, this one is an international survey it's on open access if anyone wants to go and see it. Um, it was a survey of uh, 97 countries, but three in particular, Italy, Australia, and India, and surveyed uh, frontline people to the pandemic responses in the first six months of the pandemic um, up to July, 2020. Uh, a questionnaire survey asking people how they were traveling with the pandemic. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of survey responses from the countries, three countries in particular, as I say, most said they had a plan, a task force, testing and PPE. But then there's been several more waves since then, which have really stretched many health systems. Um, but clearly that's evidence of learning because this was in the first three or four months of the pandemic leading up to July, 2020. I think some countries forgot the lessons uh, or, or, uh, or, or the virus got out of control because of the new variants. Um, Another study I did uh, early in the pandemic in the first few months was the 40 Health Systems COVID-19 study, the 40 HSC-19 study. This took mainly, um, mainly high income countries, uh, 36 OEDCD countries because data was available then, and uh, plus the Republic of China, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, and Iran, uh, and including those, included those, uh, not some other countries in the region, sadly, because I didn't have the data at that time. Uh, and we looked at three things, the country's capacity to respond, how good was its public health system and its planning for pandemics, whatever form the pandemic was going to take. What was the early stringency measures that were taken, mask wearing, quarantine, social distancing, closing down schools, lock, lock, lockdowns. And then was there a testing um, scheme put in place across the country? either broad-based, so everyone who needed a test could get one, or narrow, so that specific groups could get a test. And we're thinking of the vulnerable groups or the high impact groups, residential aged care uh, residents, or, uh, or clinicians on the front line, uh, the special groups that we need to take care of more than any other. So the results were early stringency measures you know, mask wearing, lockdown, social distancing were very important. So was the capacity inherent in the health system in the country to deal with a, any pandemic before COVID hit. And then we knew that was the pandemic that hit. These are necessary, but they're not sufficient on their own. Extended stringency measures are needed, but people were worried that that would close the economy down. So we found in our study early in the pandemic, in the first six months of the pandemic, that broad-based testing of the community was key to managing COVID-19. Maybe that's still the case. That's a matter for us to debate, perhaps, Dr. Sujit. And uh, here's a map of some of the data from that study. I won't bore you with the details, but we actually color-coded the countries and produced some two by two and then three by three um, 3D maps of how each country was relevant to the others on these 
these three parameters, these three variables, capacity to respond of the country, broadness of testing, and whether stringency was put in place early. And here's more results. These were the best countries, the best performing countries. These were the next best, and so on and so forth. So a question, and I'll push this to the end, perhaps, Dr. Sujit, or you can raise any question with the audience you wish. It's a question for you. What do you now think about being able to think through before an unknown crisis hits? Predict with confidence when, how, and when the crisis will emerge? And will we do this better in future having learned from COVID-19? That's the $64 question, the 64 million rupee question for me. Will we do this better next time around? What's the new normal? Everyone's now talking about the new normal. The curve in India and perhaps Malaysia are going down. Many other countries, although they're worried about the new variants, are doing better disaster management and have better, res more resilient health systems now. What's the new normal? Well, what do you think about the new normal? What's your health system going to look like in the future? I think language matters. <clears throat> new normal helps assist us to think about the order that must take place. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's okay. It's not a symptom. I've been tested. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so how is the next stage in the world's journey going to be when we come out of COVID-19? There's a real opportunity here to learn, to rebuild, to rebuild by design stronger health systems and stronger public health systems. Dr. Tedros says there's no return to the old normal. The old normal is not where we need to be. The old normal is what um, uh, uh, allowed some countries not to deal with COVID-19 as well as they might. So we really do need a new normal. There aren't any shortcuts. Physical distancing and social restrictions in some form are part of the new normal. So is community education. So is testing and tracing. So is the capacity of world economies to come out of this and stay viable and meet the new normal. There's potential for COVID-19 to be with us for a long time. It's going to shape the future of humanity. As Dr. Sujit said before my talk, you, sir, were ahead of your time. There are vital lessons to be learnt, and I think we're learning them, but I hope we are. And I'd just like to put in that climate change is the other pandemic. It's slower than a, an infection, but it's nevertheless what we have to face as humanity. The resilience assessment grid I would put to you is a strong uh, model for thinking through how resilient am I and what capacity do I have to manage disasters in the future? And I recommend it to you. In truth, there are many models. I choose this one because I work with it a lot and I've published uh, with it. But um, I, think it, I think it's a nice four category matrix for thinking through can I get on top of the current pandemic and can I, um, can I develop uh, and strengthen my health system for future pandemics and crises? Final slide, Dr. Sujit and colleagues. Colombia is not a high income country in, in, in South America, but it's got a project going at the moment looking at geo-referencing looking at identifying vulnerable households to target with government responses to the COVID-19 crisis. This might be a glimpse of the future where we use science not just for a vaccine, not just for better tests, but for better ways of targeting people in the community who might need help who don't know it, or they are particularly vulnerable. So I'll just leave you with that thought that some of us like me and others are applying new ideas around scientific approaches to prepare for the next pandemic or crisis. There's a hi from some of my team in Sydney, Australia, from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, saying hello to their colleagues on the call, on the webinar. Here's some acknowledgements of my teams. I'm 
blessed with a rich array of teams that support me in my work. And I've dipped into some of that work during this talk. Here's some of my recently published books. And if anybody wants a quick summary of those, if they don't have the capacity to buy one of these very expensive uh, books, um, uh, please just write me. Uh, here's some forthcoming books I'm working on. And here's how to get hold of me. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And I hope you found that useful. Dr. Sujit, back over to you. Thank you, Professor Jeffrey. And uh, that was really a scintillating session that you've had. It's, it's really something that you've taken us. You've taken us through um, the earthquake, the tsunamis, the, uh, the Spanish flu, the... <laughs> The fire, the outbreak of fire, as far as uh, you know, Australia is concerned, and I think that was um, a very, very tragic thing that you lost so many beautiful species of animals, and uh, you know there was devastation there. So um, yes, of course, and including Melbourne. Melbourne's a lovely city, and as you'd mentioned, there were lovely Indians over there. Uh, so much of culture, so much of um, uh, cricket, uh, so to say. And at the same time, and at the same time, there is this thing of resilience. In boxing terms, if you're hit, you go down, you've got to come back and be in that fight. So if you're knocked down, you damn well get up. Now, um, COVID-19 is something good that's going to be with us, and um, it's, it's not going away in a hurry. We're worried about the third wave, which might come. It might affect a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the pediatric population. So everybody is gearing up for it. So therefore, the ability to respond, uh, Professor Jeffrey, is what we are trying to do as far as India is concerned, and possibly the world is concerned. If there is going to be a third wave, then everybody is thinking about the lessons learned and how do we respond. So that's, that's something which is, uh, you know, uh, in everybody's mind. The ability to monitor, and this is something that I must say, um, a, an example from uh, Mumbai, India, is uh, the largest slum in Asia, Dharavi. You see, Dharavi is a slum which is about 2.5 miles square, but it has a population of 2 million. And it has small scale as well as registered industries. And yet there was a complete control that we had of a spread, a dynamic spread as far as Arabi is concerned. So that I would like to ask a question and uh, that is something about floods. Flooding is very common in India and also some of the other countries that you'd mentioned. The ability to respond in a flood-borne area is so much more different than dry ground. Uh, wh what would your, uh, you know, the ability to anticipate and the ability to react uh, be in flood-borne areas? Thank you, Dr. Sujit, for the excellent summary of my talk um, and also for the, uh, the commentary and questions. So um, I don't know about floods. I'm not an expert in floods, uh, uh, but it strikes me that these are anticipatable events in the resilient assessment grid, if not knowing how hard that might hit or exactly when or what the force of it might be, that there will be some floods in the future. <clears throat> Uh, we s often can pinpoint where they are likely to occur. So the resilience assessment grid approach, for example, um, and there are other approaches, of course, is to say we should have good monitoring systems. We should strengthen our ability, our capacity to respond when something does hit. That's the thunderstorm asthma kind of model. We should be monitoring the data and we should be um, learning each time to see if we can feed that forward. You know, I notice, I'm sure this is not the case um, in the case you're suggesting, but I notice that sometimes people finish with a problem, a big crisis, a pandemic, whatever it might be, a flood, a bushfire, and they don't really spend enough time looking back saying, well, what did we really learn 
And how can we change the way we deal with the next one as a result of that? This sort of relief sets in. And then we say, okay, well, we got over that, great. And then very quickly, the learning is forgotten. So I wonder if we can get better at that arising out of the pandemic or a flood or a bushfire or whatever the nature of the disaster. I wonder if we can get better at really being serious about learning from past events. The other thing I would suggest to you is there's often times when we do well, and I don't think we're very good, humans I mean, at learning when things go right. I've published a lot on this in terms of patient safety called Safety 2. Can we learn more when things go right? Sometimes when things go right, we forget about it quickly because we say to ourselves, well, that's what should have happened. Or we say, well, that's OK. Nothing much to learn there because, uh, you know, no major disaster occurred. But sometimes the fact that a disaster didn't occur is a very remarkable and important thing to learn from. Yeah, there's a few ideas anyway, Dr. Sujit. Professor Jeffrey, there's a question for you, and uh, that is to respond, you must have a good infrastructure. So therefore, the healthcare facilities, the building design systems, and how do you really get your people in uh, the throughput, as well as how would you actually conduct them across your facility? So, um, uh, uh, Dr. Yap, would like to know, uh, uh, you know, what's your view on this? Yeah. So, you know, healthcare is a high-tech, high-touch industry. It requires infrastructure, hardware, technology, but it also requires well-trained, flexible, adaptable workforces. And, it, and you need both. I see some countries spending a lot on the technology and not emphasizing enough the adaptive workforce. I see other countries doing more of the other, investing in the workforce maybe, not um, making the resources available for the technology. The answer is you need both. You need both as, right, good, right. as good an infrastructure as you can provide for the, for the price you have available, for the money you have available. Yes and a workforce fit for the future. Right, um, uh, the, uh, the last question that I'm gonna, uh, you know, um, uh, put to you is that um, motivation. Uh, there is a question from the audience that says, how do you motivate your troop? Uh, is it all about money? Is it all about incentivizing them? Or, uh, you know, how do you get the troop to be there day in, day out, 365 days a year? <laughs> That's a tough ask. That's a tough ask. It's a tough question. If I knew the answer, maybe I should start a consulting practice with you, <laughs> Dr. Shujit, and we'd make a lot of money, huh? We'd really? make a lot of money in the world. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is, it's a long game, isn't it? This is not a short game. Short-term incentives, uh, sure, everyone needs money. They've got to feed their family. Uh, they've, got to, they've got to pay the mortgage or pay the rent. Everyone has to do that. You need enough money. But um, after a while, money's only so, so important. And uh, if you, as long as you've got sufficient for your, and lots of people don't, of course, but as long as you've got sufficient for your, uh, for the work you're doing, then the next stage is to be motivated in your work. And that requires training and good leadership. I noticed there's a question on leadership amongst the, uh, amongst the chat. Uh, good leadership. It's a long term question and it needs worked on by all the stakeholders. So Dr. Jeffrey, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really dramatic and, and it was fantastic. It was a huge learning. Um, if I start asking questions, we would be here till tomorrow. And I don't intend to hold you that long. So I shall now hand this over to Dr. Joseph again. And Dr. Joseph, you may do uh, you know, the closing um, ceremony, so to say. Thank you so much, Professor Thank Jeffrey, for being with us. It was delightful listening to you and very insightful and very, very knowledgeable. Thank you so much. Thank you kindly, sir.
Thank you very much, Dr. Sujit and Professor Jeffrey for that wonderful session. Honestly, it's been an eye opener and I thoroughly enjoyed and I'm sure our participants would have enjoyed too. Wonderful feedback coming uh, for the session and we would love to have you more often, Professor Jeffrey and also Dr. Sujit. And the interesting thing that I learned today is also learning when things go right. That's a beautiful thing. I'm sure we are going to look at it from the other perspective, not when things go wrong, but learning when things go right as well. I think that will give us a lot of learning. Um, thank you very much once again. And to do the honors to Professor Jeffrey, may I invite our dear friend and president of ASQUA, Dr. Ravindran Jagasuti, uh, for your thoughts and then to present the honors to Professor Jeffrey, sir. Thank you. Uh... Prof. Jeffrey Braithwaite, uh, it has always been a pleasure listening to you talking. Uh, I think both of us are on first name basis because we have collaborated previously on some of the chapters in your books. Uh, but I think today's talk was extremely beneficial to all those who participated because of the situation that the world is in at the moment. And your examples are so illustrative that what you could learn from each of those previous examples that you quoted that will help us not only now, but in future. And I think mankind has to learn from all the disasters that we have encountered. Every country has to learn and your, your uh, examples of the various uh, uh, comparisons between the countries was also very illustrative. Each can learn from the other. So it's my pleasure, Jeffrey, to present you with a certificate uh, as a token of our encounter today uh, and your contribution as a speaker on disaster management and resilient healthcare. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Thank you, dear friends, for joining us in this webinar series, international webinar series. Really thank ISQUA and ASQUA for the partnership extended and all the participants from over 17 countries who have joined us today. Have a great evening, enjoy yourself, stay safe and let's hope to meet very soon in person. Thank you once again Dr. Sujit, Professor Jeffrey Braithwit, Professor Ravindra Jagasothi and all our governing committee members who have joined us. Dr. Anuradha, Dr. Vijay Agarwal, our secretariat for all the brilliant help provided to us and the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lalu Joseph.